Good morning. Thank you, orchestra. And let's go ahead and stand as we sing about our risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior. to see you. Didn't the Lord give us a beautiful day today? We're so glad you're here. If you are a first-time guest, we would love to meet you after the service. We ask that you would come to our hospitality suite and go through either of these doors and up the ramp. But this is where people go to join First Baptist Church or you have questions about getting involved, getting in a Sunday school class. And also, there's a wonderful place to pray back there. And we have prayer warriors that would love to pray with you. If, if there's anything that you need, that's the place to go. I hope you take a look at the bulletin today. We're starting our Wednesday night programs back, our dinner uh, this Wednesday night, and all the different Bible studies are really cranking up this week. And so you can sign up for those in the Welcome Center. Uh, there are uh, places there, information, and you can also sign up online. Uh, continue to pray for disaster relief, North Carolina Baptist men and women who go as well. Uh, we are uh, continuing to send teams to Canton, North Carolina. Uh, if you would like to go, they're going for day trips this week. And so be looking for that. You can uh, find things here in the Welcome Center to go as well. All right. Now, Chasen is out of town on a much needed break, but I tell you what, I am so grateful for all our orchestra, our choir, our singers here, don't they do a great job? And we're so grateful for them. The horn section is going to buy fried apple pies for the whole church. <laughs> Let's continue singing about our risen Savior.
grateful that Chasen leads us every Sunday in scripture reading, and let's do that right now. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus Christ is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross.
Good morning. I hope you guys enjoy the singing, uh, and we also give it to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we we can always stand just with Him. With with Him, we got everything. Without Him, Him we got nothing. But anyway, I want to take just a few minutes uh, to share with you guys about the, what Christ is doing and these outreach events that we're doing. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for you guys to uh, pray for us and, and do what you do. We have two events this past month, and I, I want you to continue to pray for so we can reach the Hispanic community. Amen. Uh, let us pray uh, for our uh, giving. Father, thank you for this wonderful time that we come and spend with you and your presence. Lord, I know you have been faithful with us. Let us help, help us be faithful and follow you and serve you and give our life, give our heart, give everything that we have for you. Thank you for the giving that our brothers and sisters are doing continuously and, and, and make them to use this wisely to reach the kingdom of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. For the last two weeks previous to this, we've been looking at that great sermon that Peter preached on Pentecost Day. Right now, we're coming to the passage that deals with how, he, how the people respond to it and how they get saved after that sermon. So look with me at Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, and I'll read for a few verses there. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as our Lord God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, saying, be saved from this perverse, the ESV translates it, crooked generation. I think that's a better translation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day there were about 3,000 souls added to them. Today, the title of my message is, What Does a True Conversion Look Like? I mentioned last week that the book of Acts is our blueprint. We don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. We can go back and see this is what God did to start the church, and this is, should be our pattern today. Well, we're going to look at how they were converted. So the title of the message is, What Does a True Conversion Look Like? But before I get to the sermon, I've got to give this disclaimer. I don't believe that any two experiences with the Lord are exactly alike. God made us as individuals, and we don't need to put people into corners. I, I'll give you an example. Billy Graham and his wife, Ruth, had two completely different experiences in circumstances as to how they were converted. Billy, when he was a teenager, Mordecai Ham, a fire and brimstone preacher, came to Charlotte, put up a tent, put sawdust on the ground. He heard the sermon, and they said, come down, walk the sawdust trail. And Billy came forward and accepted Christ and Wow, that moment, his life was changed, spent the rest of his life uh, going and doing meetings where he called people to do exactly what he did. Now, Ruth was raised in a godly missionary home overseas. She said she was raised in an atmosphere of faith. And in fact, Ruth said, I can't tell you when I was saved. I know I am saved. I know I put my faith in Jesus, but I couldn't put my finger on a point in time when that happened. Now, both of them were saved, but they had two distinct experiences with their conversion experience. Uh, to show you another example of the individuality of the Lord, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus healed many blind people, but I'll give you three examples. One man, he touched the man once and he could see immediately. Another man, he touched him the first time and says, can you see? And he says, well... I see tr men like trees walking. He touched them the second time and then he could see clearly. Another man, he spit on the ground and made mud and took the mud and put it in the blind man's eyes and said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. And as soon as the mud was washed out, he could see. So three different blind people all were given sight, but in three different ways. I believe today what would have happened is three denominations would have started. We'd have the one-touch church, the two-touch church, and the mud-in-the-eye church. And the two-touch church would tell the one-touch church, you can't really have it all yet. You only had one touch. And then the other would say, if you didn't get mud in the eye, you didn't really have a real experience. You, you just think you can see. So God is so individual, but, but there are also similarities. When it comes to Billy Graham and Ruth, 
both trusted Jesus alone for their salvation. That, that's the, the, the rope that, that combines them both. When it comes to these three lepers, they all went to Jesus and they were all healed by Jesus. So with realizing that there are dissimilarities, that each one of us are unique, let me talk to you about characteristics of a true conversion from what we see here today. Number one, a true conversion involves the mind, emotions, and will. A true conversion involves the mind, emotions, and will. That's the total of our personality, mind, emotions, and will. Where do I get that? When they asked him, what must we do? Peter replied, repent. Now that word repent is actually an interesting word. It's meta nueo. Meta means to change. Metamorphosis, a butterfly changes. Uh, Nous is the word for thinking. So literally, all the Greek word for repent means is change the way you think. You were thinking this way, you need to change that way. Now, if you think about this particular crowd, 50 days before that, just before Passover, they stood out there and they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They were ready to throw Jesus away. And now Peter is standing before them and saying, I want you to know this, this one that you engineered his death, God has made him Lord in Christ. You need to change the way you think. So there is a a sense in which a conversion involves coming to the point where I sit here and say, now what I have thought about Christ in the past is wrong. I need to see him as the son of God who died for me and rose again. There are facts that I need to settle that these are true in my life. And that's a part of conversion is the mind. But he also says, so it shows that there's emotions. In verse 37, it says they were cut to the heart. So when they were converted, not only was the mind involved, change the way you think. This this same Jesus, God has made Lord and Messiah. But he also says they were cut to the heart. There are emotions involved. Now, once again, the emotions can be different. I've watched at times when people, when they get saved, just weep like a baby. And I've watched times when people just want to shout because they're so filled with joy. Now, I'm not so much an emotional person, but I remember distinctly the emotions I felt when I put my faith in Christ. It was like here I was, an aimless person, and from that moment, the moment I had trusted Jesus, a sense of resolve came upon me. And I knew I had a purpose in life, and my emotions were set toward being what he saved me to be. We're different emotions, but our emotions are involved. If I could do an analogy, look at marriage. Different people have different uh, different experiences emotionally when they get married. I have met some people that just fall in love. I remember when she walked into the in through the door. I saw her. I've heard many a person tell me through the years. I looked at her and said, "That's the one I'm going to marry." They just felt the heart palpitations. They just knew that was it, and it turned out to be real because it lasted fifty years. But then there are others who they were friends. And one day they sat there and dawned on them, you know, maybe we should be more than friends. And so they went from friendship to grow into a strong love. Emotions can be different, but emotions are involved. And then the will. It involves your mind, your emotions, and your will. Well, how was the will involved? He told them to do something. He said, now change your mind, repent. They were cut to the heart. But he says, what you need to do is you need to change the way you're thinking. And here's what you need to do. You need to be baptized. And the act of baptism was something that they could do with a decision of their will to show the proper response to the facts they'd come and embraced about Jesus. Now, let me tell you something about baptism. Immersion was a part of the Jewish religion. Now, this first sermon is being preached in the Gentile court of of the temple. That would be the south half of the temple. If you had left right after the sermon was over and he said, what should we do? Get baptized. All you had to do was go out the southwest side and there was a set of stairway, a a stairway that went down. And today that stairway would have ended in what's called the western wall where the Jews go and pray. Maybe some of you have seen them where they're standing there and they're moving their heads and they're putting their little prayer request inside of that. But if you go just down the wall from that to the south side of the Temple Mount and take a left, there were huge, what, what we would call baptismal pools, the Jews call mikvahs there. Because there was a whole lot of dunking going on in Judaism. Uh, if you had touched a body, and if 
You were the one that had a, had a relative. It was up to you to prepare the body for burial. If you touched a body before you could re-enter the temple, you had to go in there and, and you had to be totally immersed to be clean again. If you were a Gentile and you were converting to become a Jew, your last action would be to wash the Gentile world off of you before you could enter in the temple and be a part. There was a whole lot of immersions going on. So they would have just walked there and done that. But the controversial phrase here, if you'll look with me at verse 37, Verse 38, he says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now there are some denominations that teach that baptism actually brings about forgiveness. But can I give you a little bit of a Greek lesson? The word that's translated here in Acts 2 as for is the Greek word E-I-S, ice. It's also used in Matthew 12, verse 41, and our English translations translate it completely different. In Matthew 12, 41, it says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So they, they, that word at is the same Greek word, E-I-S. Now, if you go back to Matthew 12, they didn't repent so that they'd have the privilege of hearing Jonah preached. Jonah preached and they repented as a result of Jonah's preaching. So if we were to take that same way and translate Acts 2, he's not saying be baptized so you can be forgiven. He's basically saying be baptized because you have been forgiven. So once you've been forgiven, you show that through being baptized. Uh, th this brings us to what baptism was established for in the Christian life. We've had a tradition since the 1800s and especially in Baptist churches in the South to call for people to come forward. Now, we, we send people to the hospitality suite now, but you need to know this. Before Charles Finney in the early part of the 1800s, that no one in Christian history ever called for people to walk forward to, quote, walk the aisle. That's a new invention in Christian history. So when you called for people to say, it's time for you to do something about your faith, what we do, we used to do is we call that making a profession of faith. Well, in the Bible, your quote profession of faith was when you got in the water. The very action of being baptized was saying, I'm letting you know right now that I have put my faith in Christ. I am buried with him. I'm risen with him. I believe that he died. He was buried. He rose again. And so that was a, that in your heart, you trust in Christ. But through baptism on the outside, you show it. Somebody has said that baptism is the outward sign of an invisible faith. Uh, let me give you a personal story back when I was in, in your church before. Uh, I had, was put on some, Greg Mathis, I think, put me on some committee. And so I had to be across the state at nine o'clock in the morning. And so I got up real early. And uh, so I got in my car, started driving along, hardly awake, was going down I, that 74 stretch, you know, when you go from Columbus to, to get to Shelby. And I don't even know where I was because I was barely awake when all of a sudden the yellow light on my car went on that said, you're about to run out of gas. Well, I knew enough to know that I wasn't near Forest City. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not going to make it there. And my tank was on empty. So I decided, next exit, I'm just getting off. So I got off and I said, okay, right or left? Okay, I chose to turn left. And I was going down through the country when off in the distance I saw a Texaco sign. And sure enough, as I pulled up right next to the gas pump, my car sputtered and ran out of gas right at the gas pump. And I was able to pump the gas in and was able to keep from being stranded on the highway. And I was so glad to see that Texaco sign. But can I make this clear? The sign didn't fill my car. The sign pointed to the pump where my car got its gas. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is a sign that points to what's happened to you in Jesus. Now, if you were to drive through the countryside of North Carolina now, you'll find dotted throughout our countryside a lot of gas stations that no longer work. If you see a Texaco sign, it's probably a closed gas station because I don't know if Texaco's even in this state anymore. So you can pull up and see a gas sign, but if there's no gas tanks that are working, it will do you no good. That's what baptism is. 
Now, one more thing before I talk about this mind, emotion, and will. And with the will, we choose to show our faith by being baptized. I want you to notice that what he gives is a command, not a suggestion. He said, repent. That's the imperative tense. Uh, I know that so many folks in our day and time, because there's so much disagreement among denominations, treat baptism very lightly. Some take it too seriously. Baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. But because we say it's a symbol, or even when we say it's just a symbol, we have forgotten that it was unthinkable in the New Testament that somebody would be saved without following that in baptism. Uh, not long ago, we, there's a sense in which every Southern Baptist church can say all 4,000 of our missionaries are our missionaries, but our church has several that call our church home. One of those who calls our church its home church is working among the Pashtuns. That's the particular people group that makes up Afghanistan. He's working in a different country, but just this year, he flew into Afghanistan because one of the people that he'd been working with was back in Afghanistan, and that person requested that he come there and baptize him. So sometime a few months ago, our missionary went into Afghanistan and baptized that man. Now, now you've got to understand this. Even in safer times in Afghanistan, I don't know if there's ever been a safer time, the very action of baptism puts your life in danger. But don't you know right now, because that man took the act of obedience to be baptized, he has put a bullseye on his soul, on his body, because he took it seriously and followed the Lord in baptism. Now, I'm still not leaving this point. I'm going to be quicker on the others. But here we've talked about a true conversion involves mind, emotion, and will. Let me give you another parallel that shows that from the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are the blessed passages. And I think the first three Beatitudes show this mind, emotion, and will. The first Beatitude in Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is the Greek word for absolute poverty. There was a translation that came out in the 1960s called the New English Bible. And it translated it this way. Blessed are those who know their need of God. So if this is a picture of the steps of salvation, the first step of salvation is I need to know my lostness and I need to know there's a savior. There's something my mind needs to grasp. The second of the Beatitudes is blessed are they that mourn. Well, what should happen if you, if it really dawns on you, I am lost. I have no hope outside of Christ. I have broken his heart with my actions. Don't you think that should cause conviction and mourning? But then the third step is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that word meek is an interesting word. It does not mean weakness. It's, it's the word for a horse that's been broken. It, it's when a horse decides, I'm no longer going to rebel against my master. I'm going to yield to my master. And can you see that as that progression of salvation, mind, emotion, and will? I come to understand the truth, and then I mourn over my lostness, and then I yield myself to the Lord. And by the way, Christianity is the only place where you surrender and then you win. So that's the first thing as we look at this picture of true conversions. A true conversion involves mind, emotion, and will. Number two. A true conversion comes when you believe God's promise. I, I love this promise that he gives to them when, when they say, what shall we do? And he says, well, this promise, verse 39, is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as our Lord God will call. He said, how do you get saved? Well, just believe the promise. He, he quoted the promise there earlier, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in essence, a true conversion comes when I sit here and I see the promise. Can I just put it this simply? You have to decide, do I believe John 3, 16 or not? Do I believe the promise that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life? And if I come to that point where I say, I know this is true. I can be forgiven because of what Jesus said for me, said to me and did for me. I can have a place in heaven because of what he did for me. Then that's the essence of conversion. It's believing the promise, taking it as true. Bruce Larson tells the story of a Catholic priest who lived in the Philippines. When he was a seminary student as a young man, he was an old man by this time. He had done something in secret, a sin that haunted him all those years. But he had a lady in his church 
that he knew this is a lady who regularly met with God. I mean, everybody in the church knew this is someone who had a real relationship with God. Jesus appeared to her, was real to her. And so one day he came to her and said, next time Jesus appears to you, will, will you ask him this for me? Will, will you ask him what sin I committed when I was in college? And so the lady came back a little while ago after that and he said, did you see Jesus? Yes. Did you ask him what sin I committed when I was in college? And she said, yes. And Jesus said, what sin? Because the promise is he forgives and he forgets, remembers our sins no more. Number three, a true conversion will result in the change of a crowd. Verse 40 is an interesting verse to me. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. The Greek word is scolio. We talk about scoliosis as a disease that takes a straight backbone and begins to make it curve. He says, let me tell you, this genera- there's nothing straight about this generation. Folks, what God wants us to do is say, now here's what's right and wrong. It was right and wrong 2,000 years ago. It's right and wrong today. And now what are we doing? We're all over the map. We're going here and yonder, and then we've gotten away from the straight way. And he said, what you need to do is you need to save yourself from the crooked generation. And one of the things that has to happen if you're going to follow Christ is you have to change crowds. You you will not be able to go on with God and keep the old friends that you have. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion fool of fools will suffer harm. Can I just give you a fact? The crowd you hang with will either pull you up or pull you down. You're not going to overcome your crowd. You've got to pick the crowd for what you want that crowd to do to you. Now, we're to witness people, but we're not to be companions of people that will pull us down. David said in Psalm 119, 63, I am a companion of all who fear you and those who keep your precepts. Uh, David Wilkerson won Nikki Cruz, the most feared gang member in New York, to Christ. Uh, Nikki, when God was getting through to him through David, uh, through David Wilkerson, one time pulled out his switchblade and clicked it. And said, you quit talking to me. If you keep talking to me, I'm going to cut you into little pieces. And I love David Wilkerson's response. He said, Nikki, if you cut me up into little pieces, every piece will say, I love you and God loves you. So David Wilkerson just kept at it, sharing the gospel with him. This most feared gang member in all of New York. Well, the night of Cruz's conversion, Wilkerson did something that the police said was foolish. He brought in several rival gangs into a theater had them sit in the same place. The police said, if you do that, there's going to be people die because these folks fight each other constantly. He said, God told me to do it. So he brought the gangs in. They all sat with their gangs. And then this country preacher (laughs) said, you know, I've done this by faith and we've got to take up an offering to pay for this theater. So let me have some volunteers to take up the offering. Nicky Cruz raised his hand. He was going to take up that offering. And so he got the offering plate. And when he went down, he said, give more, give more. Because his intention was to walk out with the money. And when he walked out, everybody knew that's over. He's gone. And he intended to walk right out. But something told him, go back in. And when he came back in and put that plate at the front of the meeting in that theater and sat down, Everybody paid attention. And when the invitation was given, he got up to walk forward and others got up to walk forward. But at that very moment, some of the girls in the gang, knowing that they were losing these men, did something horrible. They stood up in the back and they opened up their shirts and exposed themselves and said, if you go down there, you lose this. Some of the guys turned back around and went back. But Nicky Cruz is one of those that went forward and he changed his crowd. And then lastly, a true conversion results in forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 38. He says, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. You get the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you why you need to be converted? There are two things that you get that you need. You need to be forgiven. Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. 
It talked about a father and his teenage son in Spain, and they were estranged from each other. And finally, the son ran away, and the father said mean things to him as he ran away. But the father began to regret that. After years, he went to the Madrid newspaper and put out an, uh, an ad, and in that paper, he put these words, Dear Paco, that was the tender word he used for his son. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. 800 Pacos showed up that next day. There were that many estranged sons longing to be forgiven by their father. We need to be forgiven. But then he says, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you seen the prominence of the Holy Spirit just as we've done the book of Acts? That one of the things that makes Christianity different, other religions say, grit your teeth and try harder. And Christianity says, if you'll open up your heart, I'll come in and, and I can live this thing through you. So you need the conversion that's described here. A conversion that happens with mind. Do you believe the facts of John 3.16? With your emotions, has it hit your heart? And then with your decision, are you ready to sit here and say, I'm all in? And I'll tell you how you do that today. You walk right out these doors. You go upstairs to that hospitality suite. You find the volunteers there and say, Tell them I want to be baptized and we'll get it done. Will you pray with me about that? Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will just produce true conversions today and each Sunday that we meet. You are a God who changes lives and we pray that you'll do it again and again. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen.